Hello YouTube, welcome to the Educated Barbarian part 5, I believe, focused on how to lead a happy life. In today's episode, I'm going to cover two chapters. We are starting with chapter 7. If you remember last uh, week, I think it was two weeks ago actually, we discussed the chapter called No Felicity Like Peace of Conscience. And today we are going to discuss the notion that a good man can never be miserable nor a wicked man happy. There is not in the scale of nature a more inseparable connection of cause and effect than in the case of happiness and virtue, nor anything that more naturally produces the one or more necessarily presupposes the other. So always with these chapters, and with Seneca, you have to pay attention to the introduction always. Because the first sentence gives you an idea of what you need to look out for. And sometimes there are tangents where it looks like the theme is being lost, but it always resurfaces. So if you struggle to understand the point of the chapter, focus on the title and the very first two sentences. They are always going to tell you what it's supposed to talk about. And in this case, it's going to offer an almost mathematical equation that compares the acquisition of virtue to happiness as a matter of fact. And that is very important because a lot of people would ask you, why should I be virtuous? If it's asking so many efforts of me, why should I do it? Well, it's very simple. It's because it makes one happy. We are in such manner influenced as if a ray of the divinity were dipped in a mortal body. And that is the perfection of mankind. It is true. We have not the eyes of eagles or the sagacity of hounds. So here, virtue is presented as something that is unique to humans and that makes us special. And I would actually agree with that. When you discuss the difference between humans and animals, if you, if you actually dig deep enough, you're going to come to a point where you might even revert back to a position that is going to lead you to believe that we are still animals. And in a sense, we are in the flesh. But in the spirit, we have achieved something superior. And this is what makes us also superior in terms of the physical. Meaning that, as he describes here, if you were to just look at brutish attributes, like strength, for example, many animals outdo us completely. The ones that are the same weight as us, of course, do, but even much smaller animals. Like, for example, it's, there's a stat that is very interesting that many people would think is untrue at first, but an adult male, if stuck in a cage with a cat, with a wild cat, would not be able to kill that cat without weapons. And the reason for that is because even though we are heavier than the cat, you will not be able to put your hands on that thing. And anyone who actually tamed a wild cat can uh, actually corroborate that statement because we have lost a lot of what makes us good in terms of fighting with our bare hands. Most people, even if you could get close to the cat and touch it, it would claw you once and the pain would make you recoil. And that is magnified with other animals. And yet we dominate them to the point where we're not even in the food chain with them. Because you have never, unless you live in certain parts of Africa or Asia, you have never woken up thinking, hmm, I need to be careful about a certain animal so that I don't die. No, never. Why? Because we're removed from that competition. It's over. We're far superior to them. And that, some people would say, comes from our conscience, our intellect, whatever. But here, Seneca argues that it comes from our virtue. And that virtue was bestowed upon us by a divinity. So in a sense, it will explain also the entire idea of the Genesis where God made a clear distinction between animals and men. It's the reason why people will say, oh, we're still animals. Well, our creator in every single big religion has clearly de de uh, defined the fact that this is not true. We are not animals, we are humans. We are above that. We are our own thing, in a sense. How much a braver creature is a lion, which by nature, how to be first and terrible. How much braver, I say, it is natural horror than in these chains, so that everything in its pure nature pleases us best. It's the reason why I tell you to always pay attention to those metaphors and not think that they're just there 
as illustration to be decorative, they always have a meaning and a sense and they always connect to other things. So he presents that dichotomy between men and animals because he follows up by saying that even though we're not the same, the nature of the virtue within us is on a ba it's, it's balanced, meaning that just like we admire animals in the wild and we hate to see them caged and miserable, you should admire virtue in men in the same manner because virtue has replaced instinct in a sense. Your human instinct, your animal instinct is very dull and very weak compared to the instinct of an actual animal. And we traded that for virtue. And if I were to put that uh, again on, on the scale with something more physical and more tangible, we gave away a lot of our brute strength to develop more dexterity. We are much more capable of fingers and we have, we have opposing thumbs, opposable thumbs. That was a trade-off. Likewise, we traded our instinct for the ability to get uh, virtues. And that is, in a sense, the plight and challenge of humans, right? Animals, unless born in captivity, are born with instinct. And in a sense, a lot of that instinct is being passed down by their parents. They teach them how to develop that instinct. But for you, most likely, your parents never taught you how to be virtuous. So the problem is that this is not something that is acquired innately. No one is born virtuous. So it's something that we must work on. It is not health, nobility, riches that can justify a wicked man. Nor it is the want of all these that can be discredited a good one. So here, it's taking away the idea that anything but virtue could tell you if someone is a good person or not. A lesson that even though on paper looks obvious and for you who enjoys philosophical talks, maybe is, but for the average population it's not. Keep in mind that the average person worships uh, riches. They worship celebrities. Why? Because they have money and power. These things don't make you virtuous. Quite the opposite, actually. And yet, it's enough for some to decide, oh, this is a good person, this is a successful person. And yet, it is quite the opposite. And the absence of these things also cannot tell you if someone is a good person or not. It is the edge and temper of the blade that makes a good sword, not the richness of the scabbard. Very important lesson as well. One that uh, also exists in other languages, in French, we say l'habit ne fait pas le moine, which is not, it's loosely correlated, but the, the idea is the same. The things that shine the most are, are usually not necessarily the most important. Tout ce qui brille n'est pas d'or. All that shines is not gold. And that is very important because in a materialistic world, where we are constantly bombarded with the idea that accumulating riches is the way to be happy, it's important to be reminded that this is not true. What needs to be accumulated is wisdom that leads to virtue. The rest is superfluous, if not a, a bother. It might, it might actually be tying you down and uh, preventing you from elevating yourself. It is every man's duty to make himself profitable to mankind, if he can to many, if not to fewer, if not so, neither to his neighbor. But however... To himself and here there is a gradation and it's it's in reverse order the number one uh, most important person you need to be good to and you need to see to develop is yourself if you're not doing that you're missing the point there is no point in being benevolent if you haven't started with you because this benevolent is going to be tainted and it's not going to be sustainable on top of that and so if we're looking at what is being presented to us here it starts at the center so this is you. And then as you expand your virtue, your circle of influence and of goodness expands with you. You cannot start with the circle like this. People who pretend to care about everyone and everything are lying. And for the most part, they don't even care about themselves. It expands. So you start with yourself, then your neighbor or family, whatever you want to call it, then your community at large, then your country, and then the wood, if you even get to that. 99.99, .99, I won't even to say 100% of people will never get to that because it demands tremendous virtue. But it's interesting to see that many people claim to do that. They claim to globally care about humans, which is a total lie. And usually these people, when you talk to people in their life, they'll tell you, yeah, he's a piece of shit. 
because it's just virtue signaling, which is the opposite of actually developing your virtue. Above all things, we must be sure to keep ourselves in action, for he that is slothful is dead, even while he lives. And that connects to what I just said. You are going to keep yourself busy developing virtue. Why? Well, because virtue brings happiness. Why? Because it keeps you in action. Being Im uh, immobile is the death of men. When you stop challenging yourself, you are dead. Stagnation is death. Always remember that. Never allow yourself to stagnate because before you know it, you're going to regress. And once that momentum is building back up and you're going in reverse, it's it's actually tough to stop, but the good thing is that that momentum goes both ways. Once you're launched on the path to virtue, you just keep going. There is no stopping that train, which is quite excellent. And you do not want to be a dead man walking, which many people are nowadays. I think um, the archetype of the zombie in horror movies has always fascinated me because there is a, there is a deeper reading and meaning behind it. It's not just a monster who eats brains. That's usually the movies that depict zombies as just that miss the point and they tend to be bad movies. The best zombie movies use the fear of becoming a zombie to make them scary. They use the fear of infestation, of the degradation of the human body. Because in reality, a zombie is body horror, but it's more intelligent than just showing a corpse that is decaying. A lot of the time, it's the fact that you know that the zombie is completely mindless. That's what's sc very scary about zombies, is that they don't think, and therefore it makes them, in, uh, it makes them predictable in their unpredictability because they have ceased to be human. And in a sense, they have regressed back to animals because their virtue has been replaced by instinct. When you get beaten by a zombie, you lose your conscience and your instinct and it's being replaced by pure, uh, uh, you, you lose your conscience and your virtue and it's being replaced by pure instinct because the second you get beaten, you immediately go to bite other people. And that is the metaphor be uh, behind the zombie archetype. It's that idea of regressing back to animal and then starting to hunt humans. And it's, if we go, I mean, I could make a video about that, but if we go even deeper, it's, I think, also the fear of losing supremacy that humans are terrified of. Because in a lot of zombie movies, what happens is that there is a collapse of civilization and the zombies just erase society because now you can't focus on the economy, you have to survive and not be eaten. So it's also the idea that our, our end will come from ourselves if we allow ourselves to regress because that regression will lead us to hunt each other. I think that's uh, a pretty good read of what is going to happen to this world eventually, which will not be through a zombie apocalypse. People will not need to be zombified to act like this. Because reverting back to our instinct and abandoning virtue is quite possible without actually needing to be, you know, poisoned with an imaginary virus. It is not for a wise man to stand shifting and fencing with fortune, but to oppose her barefaced, for he is sufficiently convinced that she can do him no hurt. Another introduction to uh, the uh, following, uh, what I want, I want to call a sub-chapter, because there's a, there's a shift here in subject matter. But the idea is that... If a good man can never be miserable, and that virtue is something that must be actually followed intensely, then you need to also provide the reader with methods to, to help deal and cope with contradictions that might arise. And in this case, the idea is this. If I am to be a wise man, what do I do with fortune? Do I accept it? Do I fight it? And what you're told here is that you're supposed to accept it. But we'll see that it goes deeper than that. It's more interesting than just that. Because you should be convinced that she can do him no hurt, and that's correct for the reason that follows. Demetrius, upon the taking of Megara, asked Stolpo, the philosopher, what he had lost. Nothing, said he, for all I had that I could call my own about me. And yet the enemy had then made himself master of his patrimony, children, and country. All right. So the idea here is that all of the things that Demetrius lost were of no... It's not that they were not of, of no interest or he wasn't attached to them, but that by not allowing himself to feel hurt at their loss, 
the loss didn't hurt because in a sense it's a choice to make and we are at a crossroads here because this is the point where you could start to believe that stoicism is a form in a sense of nihilism because here the guy literally lost everything in his life and outside of the, the grandiose stoic principles he still lost his family and country so at what point do we separate between a stoic and a wimp and someone who just let things happen to him? Well, you'll see that in this case, it only functions if providence had put you in a situation that is impossible to dodge. For example, if a wolf attacks your wife and you go, Psh, that's providence, goodbye, honey, and I have a good time, you're a wimp, you're not a stoic, that's not stoicism. But if you learn that your wife has cancer and that she cannot survive it, now it's unavoidable. So you have a choice to make. Do you let that get to you? Or do you decide that this was just providence and that since it cannot hurt you, you will not be hurt? This is a lesson that I'm going to be honest with you, I would not be able to apply. But it's what is being taught here. You're not being told to be passive. You're being told to be accepted, uh, accept, accepting. Okay, what is the objective with accept, accepting? Accepted? No. Accepting, yeah, I was correct the first time. You need to be accepting of things that are just there and that cannot be avoided. Walls and castles may be mined and battered, but there is no art or engine that can subvert a steady mind. And that goes beyond just pain and hurt. It also works with a, with a mental subversion and uh, ideological warfare and, uh, and uh, propaganda as well. I have found that the people who are the most susceptible to propaganda and to being brainwashed are the people who don't have a steady mind. And maybe they lack stubbornness a little bit. Because you should be a little bit stubborn with your ideas, right? They shouldn't just be interchangeable and flimsy. Let's say you believe in something firmly and I challenge it. You should listen to my arguments, but you shouldn't just accept them as is. The problem, of course, is that this is basing the entire concept around the fact that people have ideas which most people don't. Most people don't think at all. So the, the first time they hear something, it replaces a, an empty spot in their head, in their brain, and they believe that now. And maybe next they'll change it or whatever, but it's not really them who is thinking, it's someone else who is thinking for them. Outside of that, the human mind is as indestructible as, I mean, nothing, because there's no comparison. There is nothing as sturdy as a mind that is prepared. Let us not take this character that I described previously, Demetrius, either for a chimera, for all ages of fought some, though not many, instances of this elevated virtue. So to bring back some realism into it, right? Because the problem with philosophy in general is that it tends to present characters of great virtue that need to be emulated, but that are so far removed from the average person that it becomes even a bit discouraging. And a good example and one that we are going to cover is the Übermensch by Nietzsche. If you read uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the Übermensch does, is not like some guy who's like six feet six with a perfect jawline and who for some reason has demigod abilities. No, he's the common man. And the rise of the common man will bring upon a new age. And so here in the Stoic writings, it's the same idea. All of these tales of virtue are accessible to the average person as long as they give themselves enough time and uh, are willing to put in the efforts to become someone virtuous. And when they become that, they're going to become a chimera themselves, which is not one at the end of the day because they started average. Funny how these lessons apply to everything in life. The idea that talent and being special is so important was really important, I find, by our extremely individualist societies because even in the writings of the Greek that include characters that look to be destined, like Hercules, when you actually look at it, one, uh, the number one gift of Hercules wasn't his physical strength, it was his mind and his willpower. And two, he started from here. It's not like he was grandiose from the start. So I think that the star system and Hollywood and all of that we have now, the celebrity worship phenomenon, 
has put a lot of people in a dire situation where they just cannot believe in their own agency and power anymore because they have bought the idea that to be special you need to be born special, which is not true. In the instance of Stolpo that I described, who, when he had lost his country, his wife, his children, the town, on, the town sorry, on fire over his head, himself escaping very hardly and naked out of the flames, said, I have saved all my goods, says he. My justice, my courage, my temperance, my prudence. So first off, correction, this is not the guy I was talking about here. Dimitri, uh, Demetrius was the one who was put in a situation where he didn't have a choice. And I say Demetrius, it's Demetrius. Stolpo is a different case, because if you listen to what I just said, he escaped. I've, I cannot help but find it a little bit silly and, and goofy to like escape the flames and be like, pew, I saved everything I needed. And like your wife is burning in the house behind you. He, this is where I draw the line. I don't know the circumstances of what happened here, if he couldn't save them or anything. I'm just going to say that for me, I would die in the flames trying to save my family instead of just, just saving my ass. On a purely survivalist basis, it's completely stupid, but since I made a clear distinction between virtue and instinct, well, uh, I would follow my virtue, and he followed his instinct. So in a sense, sometimes you see incoherences in Stoic texts, you know, the texts are not perfect. To me, this is a clear example of someone who just ditched their virtue because it was just not conducive to their survival, and then Seneca saying that this is still virtue, I don't agree with that. Let me know what you guys think. This is the difference betwixt a man, sorry, wrong. This is the difference betwixt a mean and an exalted mind. The former is rude and tumultuary. The latter is modest, vulnerable, vener venerable, sorry, composed and always quiet in its station. So here he's offering the difference between someone who actually is a wicked man and someone who is a wise man. And we have already discussed that. The issue with wickedness is that it's unstable. That's the big problem with it. It's like chaos in a sense. Chaos and order are two very important things. And I'm not likening chaos to wickedness, by the way. It's just that in terms of energy, they are very similar. Chaos creates order because you need chaos to actually have order because if there were no chaos, there would need not be any order. For wickedness to exist, uh, the opposite is not true, meaning that virtue does not give birth to wickedness and vice versa. Wickedness is a creation of men. We could, as a species, just be pure and virtuous. It is possible. We could never be orderly entirely because nature would bombard us with chaos, which is its, its job, by the way. But it never does so with wickedness. So this is a, an instability that is unneeded and a meanness of sorts. It is the conscience that pronounces upon the man whether he be happy or miserable. And that was covered last time. So if you want to listen to that, go back to the, epi the last episode, which I think, again, I hope was episode four. It's tough to keep track of these. And now we're going to start chapter eight, which is called... The due contemplation of divine providence is the certain cure of all misfortunes. But before I do that, I'm going to check the time. Excellent. Again, first few sentences, very important. Whoever observes the wood and the order of it will find all the motions in it to be only vicissitudes of falling and raising. Nothing extinguished, and even those things which seem for us to perish, are in truth but changed. So here, it's talking about the title, right? Because the due, the due contemplation of divine providence is the certain cure of all misfortunes. This is providence that was just, just described. And... What fascinates me with this is that this sentence links to all of the development of physics of the 14th century in Europe and the work of Lavoisier as well, who said, Rien ne se crée, rien ne se perd, tout se transforme. And this idea was already contained in this book because it was in nature. And in reality, even someone who has never studied physics in their life, just look at life around you, look at nature, and you will be able to tell. 
Energy never disappears. There is no such thing as a wasted energy. It changes. It transforms. Water that evaporates goes into the clouds. It becomes rain. Nothing is truly lost because nothing is created from nothing. So if there can be no creation from the void, then surely nothing can go into the void. That is an important lesson because it gives you a good idea of what providence is. Providence is not an arbiter of appearance and disappearance. It's simply a cycle. And as such, it cannot be cruel and it cannot be unfair. Keep these things in mind. It is the part of a cowardly soldier to follow his commander groaning. But a generous man delivers himself up to God without struggling. Another thing to keep in mind. We're going to talk about God a lot in this chapter in particular because providence is an act of God. And if I didn't, like, for example, if you didn't know that you're actually listening to a book from Seneca, you would think that this is taken from the Bible because the amount of references that are found to be like one-to-one -one copies in Christian texts and scripts and scriptures is insane. You will see as I go, but keep in mind one thing here. God in this case is nature, right? It's, it's the le grand tout, the, 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 what I described first, which, which, which that creates all, but destroys none. This endless circle, the source. With Marcus Aurelius, we call it the source. So maybe we can go back to that. But if you hear God, that's what we're talking about here. And for someone to complain about having to follow God's orders is cowardly, of course, because there is no other way out. And just like we've described with the previous chapter, if you know that you must do it, then just do it. Don't complain about it. It is only for a narrow mind to condemn the order of the wood and to propound rather the mending of nature than of himself. You could tell me, okay, well, this looks awfully like a fatality in a sense. I'm supposed to just follow fate and not complain. No, that's not what is being told here. What is being told is that there is no such thing as fate and that whatever happens to you happens. That's it. For you to complain and say that it's unfair is stupid because now you believe in fate. You believe that this was inflicted upon you by someone. It wasn't. It's just you being caught into the endless stream of providence. And the only thing you can do is swim with the current. Because why are you trying to swim backwards? You know, you're the, it's exactly that. You're the equivalent of someone who is streaming upstream when he's actually trying to get downstream, complaining that it's hard and he's getting nowhere. Yeah, because you're swimming the wrong way. Just go with the stream and stop complaining. No man has any cause of complaint against providence, if that which is right pleases him. Very important lesson, because many people like to complain, and many people like to complain about their station in life, and I see that all the time. And I know I might, some people would say, well, you're not in a good position to talk about these people because you yourself are not in their position. But I'll, I'll actually still do it because I do what I want. But on top of that, more importantly, I think that I'm in the best position. Because as someone who is not afflicted with anything serious, I can tell you for a fact that whatever you think is ruining your life truly is not. What is ruining your life is your attitude towards it. I don't care what handicap you have. I don't care what disadvantages you had when you were born. All of that is not a motive for giving up or complaining about it because the only thing it's do it, doing truly is slowing you down. In fact, someone who is in a wheelchair and who is down in the gutters because of it is slowed down much more by his attitude than his handicap. And that is true for every single person on earth. Your situation and your condition is your own. And it's, it's there maybe to stay, maybe to go, but it does not matter. What matters is the way you look at it, always. Those glories, talking about people like me, for example, who don't have a handicap or who might have something that is perceived to be higher, like, I don't know, beauty, success, height, uh, fame, whatever. Those glories that appear fair to the eye, their luster is false. They are only vanity and delusion. They are rather the goods of a dream than a substantial possession. They may oozen, they may cozen us, a verb that I do not know uh, existed, 
but bring them once to the touch, thou rotten and counterfeit. So, complicated in a sense. Here is a human. He is afflicted by providence. Whether that affliction is good or bad does not matter, because at the end of the day, it's uncontrollable. Something that you cannot control cannot be good or evil, it just is. Might it give you an advantage or disadvantage? Of course, yes. But letting it dictate your life is never a good thing, because even if it's good and you are blessed with talents, if you let, it, that, get, if you let that get to your head, you will live a shitty life, because virtue will have escaped you because you have started to either question the bestowings of providence or let them possess you when in reality they are not to be because they are just vanity, they are an illusion. The bounties of providence are certain and permanent blessings. So, okay, Seneca, you just told me that all of this was nothing. What is this? Well, there is a difference between what providence gave you without you having to do anything and the bounty. Because what is a bounty? Do you just stumble upon it? Uh, maybe if you're very lucky, but most of the time you have to work for it. It's, it's, a, it's a reward. So what you obtain from providence via work, aka virtue, that is permanent. So it's opposing two things that it's, in a sense come from the same source, but with a different intent. Because if we say that providence is the source, or God, whatever you want to call it. It's like if God, and maybe that's blasphemy to say, but it's like if, if God was a sprinkler. It sprinkles people, like, indiscriminately. If you can sprinkle with water, well, okay, good. If you don't, same thing. You didn't control it. But if you actually seek the water and you collect it in a cup and drink it, that is virtue. That is you seeking that thing from providence and that took time and effort on your part. And therefore, the action of doing that is permanent. Another thing here, with metaphors, it's the problem with metaphors. I love them, but a lot of the time they have so many layers that it's very easy to confuse people. This does not mean that virtue is permanent. You can be virtuous and lose it. It means that the action of seeking virtue is. The, for example, again, with the same metaphor, your glass is filled and you drink it. It's empty now. It's not permanent. But the action of seeking more water will always be. That is to say, to continue with the, the, the metaphor, the power of condemning things, condemning things terrible and despising what the common people covet. So that is an ex extension in a sense of virtue but is it really because at the end of the day it's what virtue is virtue makes you judgmental because once you have acquired it you can see what is not virtuous and this is the problem too in a sense with acquiring that skill is that and when you're not virtuous you have no way to discern what is not virtuous so you might actually pursue it which takes you away from virtue quite the conundrum which is why you should chase virtue it's like learning about snakes you learn about poisonous snakes, and once you do that, you won't be afraid of snakes anymore because you know which ones are dangerous, and the, the other ones you can just walk right by, past them, they're not dangerous. But for the person who doesn't know, they'll just walk by any snake and get beaten and die because they just don't have the ability to recognize what is dangerous for them. In the very methods of nature, we cannot but observe the regard that providence had to be good of mankind. Even in the disposition of the wood, in providing so amply for maintenance and satisfaction. So that is for the people who might actually have grief, not necessarily with what providence bestowed upon them, but what it is itself. Because that's something you hear a lot. And we'll get to that, I don't want to spoil, but a lot of people, they complain not just about the situation, but about the wood that has made them like this. And the issue here is that this is just factually incorrect. Because if you look at life, look at this earth, can you think of a better adapted place for humans? The reason why we complain so much is because we're spoiled brats. But in reality, life could be so much tougher. This earth is a paradise, in a sense. Garden of Eden, what? This is the Garden of Eden. It's perfect for us, for our survival. 
And just telling yourself that every day will make you just more appreciative of everything in life. Because nature is good. God is good. It is not possible for us to comprehend what the power, with a uh, capital P, is which has made all things. Some few spots of that divinity are discovered, but infinitely the greater part of it lies hid. This was written, I don't know, I'm going to be wrong because I'm not uh, that versed in history, but I think something like a uh, thousand years before Islam was uh, revealed to the world. This is an important teaching of Islam and of many religions, but in Islam insists on it. You cannot understand what God dictates. You cannot, because it's a divinity. But if we replace God by nature, you cannot understand the, the dictatorship quote unquote, of nature. And you shouldn't even try, because there is no point. Just like trying to understand why it rains outside. If you focus on the scientific aspect, it's interesting. But if you try and find a reason, why is it raining now? Now, well, no one decided that. It's just nature doing its thing. It's just that circle. And you could become mad trying to figure it out. So once you accept that, you accept that only a part of it is revealed to us, your life will be easier. If there will be a providence, and that was the part I was going to get at, say some, how come it to pass that good men labor under affliction and adversity? And wicked men enjoy themselves in ease and plenty. My answer, and that is Seneca talking, is that God deals by us as a good father. He tries us, he hardens us, and fits us for himself. So this is a, a very common counter-argument you will hear people spout about religion, where they say, well, if God is real, what is he, why is he uh, making it so hard for us? Why do people die? Etc., etc. And here, Seneca tells you that it's because God gives his toughest lessons to his most fervent followers or worshippers, whatever you want to call it, which could also be counter-countered by someone saying, well, what about a kid that dies like at two days old? That kid wasn't ready for that challenge yet. If you want to hear what I believe, what I believe personally is that God, whatever God, God you want to believe in, gave us earth and then bounced. Not in the sense that he left, but in the sense that he's leaving us to our own device because, well, we decided to do our own thing. So we are now the masters of the earth, and that comes with a lot of benefits because we do whatever we want, but also comes with a lot of dangers because we're not protected anymore. In the Garden of Eden, he would safeguard us, but on earth, he stopped because, well, he's a good father, he's respecting our choices. So that, in a sense, connects with what is being said here. And then... If you connect God to nature and providence, well, nature just tests. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care. It'll give the flu to some guy like me who is going to not even feel it. Then it'll give it to some 90-year-old grandpa who will die in a day. Because it just tests and whoever survives, survives. In a sense, it also is survival of the fittest out there. Now, why would a God want that? Well, who knows? I mean, the les voies du Seigneur sont impenetrables, right? As the master gives his most hopeful scholars the hardest lessons, so does God deal with the most generous spirits, and the cross encounters of fortune were well, not to look upon as cruelty, but a contest. I'm going to push away the God thing here because, as I explained, we run into contradictions. If you think that a, a benevolent God would do that, the problems arise because that would mean that God is preparing us for something, but for what? Maybe the, the judgment day. Maybe that's that. That's very possible. That would mean also that a kid that dies because of a illness will go to heaven naturally. That's also possible too. I'm more interested in thinking about that from the nature standpoint because that's when it gets real in my, in my personal opinion. In this case, it's a contest, which is true. This word is a contest. It's an endless competition. And anyone who refuses to partake loses by default. And the contest is as such. You will be tested with good and bad fortune, and if you fail, you fail. And you cannot turn to anyone but yourself, because you are the reason why it happened. 
And nature cannot be cruel, by the way. The lion that kills the, the deer, which they don't do that because there's no deer in Africa, but uh, the lion that kills its prey is not being cruel. It's following its instinct. Likewise, nature which imposes hardship on you is not being cruel. It's just being itself. There are people that live in a perpetual winter in extremity of frost and penury, me with just the frost, where a cave, a lock of straw, or a few leaves is all their covering, and wild beasts their nourishment. All this by custom is not only made tolerable, but when it is once taken upon necessity, little by little, it becomes pleasant to them. And that is a little teaser in a sense to a video I'm preparing about comfort. That's what he's talking about here. Comfort makes you miserable because comfort takes you away from the hardship of providence, meaning that when it occurs, you act surprised. People who live shitty, shitty lives in shitty, shitty countries are happier than Westerners. Why? Because life is so bad and the baseline is so low that a bad day for, for us is a gorgeous day for them. And a lot of people don't like to hear that because they're like, well, my happiness doesn't need comparison. Well, it's true, but on a one-to-one -one basis in your own life, realizing what you have instead of complaining about what you don't have would make you more happy and also more virtuous. And it's interesting to see also that what some would see as discomfort, once you get used to it, is just not even tolerable, but also pleasant. For example, for me with the cold, the cold for a lot of people, they would be miserable. I actually love it. I, when it's like below 20, I'm having a feast because I just learned to actually appreciate it as just a, an offering of nature. It's not nature decided, you know what, fuck that guy. It's going to be super cold today. I hope his balls fro uh, freeze off. No, it's just cold. I get to complain about it or I get to go out in the snow and play. We are apt to murmur at many things as great evils that have nothing at all of evil in them besides the complaint, which we should more reasonably take up against ourselves. Just what I said here. Your misery is created by you and you only, or by another human, but never by nature. If it's another human, you fix it. If it's yourself, you fix it. Simple. But it's easier also to ascribe the evil to things because it gives us first off it's a way to victimize ourselves which is always bad and two it gives us an excuse to not take responsibility like oh it's just this wood is terrible and life sucks and blah 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 no 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 no, no. you suck buddy you suck understand that and your life will be fixed it is quite easy actually all those terrible appearances that make us groan and tremble are but the tribute of life we are neither to wish, nor to ask, nor to hope to escape them. For there is a kind of dishonesty to pay a tribute unwillingly. So not only are you to accept providence, you, have, you are to do it with a smile. Not because you're forced or because it's fate, but because it makes it better. It makes it easier and seamless. Which is what I describe with the people who live in cold environments. Life is a... I love this one. Life is a warfare. And what brave man would not rather choose to be in a tent than in shambles? Fortune does like a swordsman. She scorns to encounter a fearful man. There is no honor in the victory while there is no danger in the way to it. So, life is war, and the most difficult battles you are going to fight are the ones you are going to remember, because they are the best ones. I have to say that in the video about uh, why do we lift. If I removed all of the struggle from your life, you would be miserable. It's the reason why rich kids, poor kids, all of the like SJW movement, all of these are people with no problems in their lives. And so they're actively seeking them out. They're trying to create something because that's the problem too with, uh, with what we are nowadays. Modernity has shielded us from providence way too much. Meaning that we used to be bombarded by chaos, primordial chaos, but our our ego and narcissism as humans has created like a, a, a shield that protects us from it. But see what it has done? It has made us miserable. People are depressed nowadays, not because their life is tough, but because it's not, not tough enough. So 
you need to put yourself in situations where difficulties can find you and then beat them and tell me if you don't feel happy. It is only in adverse fortune and in bad times that we find great examples. Absolutely. None of your heroes, none of the person that you like and try to emulate were just some kid who never had any problems and at 25 they got like a trust fund. No. Like if you do worship people like this in like inventors or whatever, like gurus, well, I'm sorry to say that you have shit role models. The best role models are the people who suffered, who struggled, because they are the purest expression of the human spirit. And we are further to consider that many a good man is afflicted only to teach others to suffer, for we are born, for example. So not only does providence bestow you with the ability to better yourself, it also helps you because it's allowing you to teach others. What is there not to love about that? In truth, I ask you. We only fear things that are many times beneficial to us. But on the other side, we anchor after and pursue things that are deadly and pernicious. We are poisoned in the very pleasure of our luxury and betrayed a thousand times by a thousand diseases because of the indulgence of our palate. I don't even have to say anything about that. It is so true. You constantly go after things because they're pleasurable, not understanding that they're terrible for you, and the things that are actually good for you, you shy away from them because they're painful and tough. And that's how you wake up one day at 35 with a shitty, shitty life and a bad momentum to boot. Don't do that. If you listen to me and you haven't done that mistake yet, prevent yourself from falling into that trap at all costs. No man knows his own strength or value, but by being put to the proof, and that is true as well. If you want to develop your full potential, you need to open yourself up. If you're constantly hiding, you will stay at the same level for the rest of your life. It's like someone who squats 200 pounds for the rest of their life. They'll never grow because they refuse to challenge themselves. The rich man knows not how to behave himself in poverty. He that has lived in popularity and applause knows not how he would bear infamy and reproach, nor he that never had children how he would bear the loss of them. Calamity is the equation of virtue and a spiritual great mind. So, okay, these are the, the, the bounties, 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 the bar that you snack on that is terrible for your health, the bounties of providence. It makes you tougher, allows you to teach others to be tough, and prepares yourself for even tougher times. The people who are shielded will die off. And it's something, by the way, that is going to happen extremely soon in Western countries, especially uh, France, Germany, Sweden, all of that. There's a bunch of men in these countries that have never had to deal with life, with real life. And when it's going to finally meet them, they're not going to be prepared. Because when... He, when Providence would have actually helped you to get to your level here and then challenge you with something at this level so that you have to raise here, they'll be here. And this is going to knock at their door and they're going to just be crushed entirely. So if you are in that case, toughen yourself up now. Do it. Remove the shield, all right? Because the shield that is protecting you will fall apart. And when it's not there anymore, the sword will be. And you won't stop it. Many times, a calamity turns to our advantage, and great ruins have but made way to greater glories. And that is that circle of providence I described. Providence is incapable of destroying. It just cannot do that. It doesn't possess that ability. It can only uh, squash so that it grows back again on top of that. Always. So when you are at the bottom, understand that this is the best way to get back up. Use your failures to promote future successes. To show now that the favors are the crosses of fortune and the accidents of sickness and of health are neither good nor evil, God permits them indifferently both to good and evil men. And this is why I told you, always keep an eye out because that guy Seneca is not messing around. There's an entire paragraph separating two sentences that are connected. He starts by telling you, that that's two pages ago, that providence tests his 
children and God is, God is testing his children with his toughest battles if he thinks that you're ready to take them on. And I told you, hmm, there are flaws to that argument. But actually, no. He explains it here. He continues. The proof that providence and God exist, even though they are good, but are responsible with big quotation marks for our misery, is that this misery happens to everyone equally. If God targeted people, then yes, maybe you could say, well, that's not very nice of you. But in this case, it's not true. The idea that, oh, bad people flourish and good people suffer. No, no, no. That's what you perceive with your limited human mind. But in truth, it's just, again, as I said, a sprinkler. It doesn't discriminate. It's just saying whoever can take it, takes it, and whoever cannot, dies. And I like this one. This is important. If you don't believe in God, or maybe if you do and you have doubts sometimes, this is what Seneca has to say for that. Do we expect now that God should look to our luggage too? And by luggage, he means body. Essentially, what you're being told is, Providence has given you a body. It's given you earth, nature, that is incredible and fitted for us. It's given us the ability to get tougher, to teach others to get tougher, and to prepare ourselves for future struggles. And on top of that, you're going to ask God that he preserves your body? That's what you want next, like a million dollars and a glass of warm milk? We already have such a, a, a magnificent deal that we are not in any position to complain. Yes, the body is mortal. Yes, and it's subjected to, to hardship. But that's, that's what makes us human. That's the, that's the deal that we got. Many afflictions may be for a good man, but no evil, for countries will never incorporate. Small sentence, the most, the most uh, disgustingly complicated sentence in this entire chapter, because here we are presented with two different substances, quote-unquote, that do not mix. Evil, and whichever it cannot incorporate, which is man. And this is because evil cannot come from providence, and a man cannot be evil. He can just act as such, and he can die evil, yes, but his nature in itself was never evil to start with, because they just don't mix. A creature that is purely evil would not be human anymore, and a creature that's purely good, without the potential of being evil, would not be human either. But a human that is good through action is virtuous and therefore has transcended the limitations of our condition. Affliction keeps a man in use and makes him strong, patient, and hardy. Providence, so first off, let's talk about this. You are being kept usable and ready, at the ready, by affliction, as I said, if you didn't have that, you would wither away and die. Providence treats us like a generous father and brings us up to labor, toil, and, danger, and face dangers. God loves us with a masculine love. And this is very interesting. Because God is a masculine figure. People who tell you that God is a gender, that is not true. God is a man, is the reason why we depict him as a man. And it's not sexist, it's biological. Biological for one simple reason. Providence in nature is female. And the, the thing on top of that, if you believe in a God, is not. So there is, there is a connection here. right? I hope I was clear enough when I was uh, talking to you about providence, nature, and God. These are not the same entities, but they serve the same purpose. And wow, let, let's go all the way. If you look at virtue, wisdom, and uh, uh, wisdom, philosophy, wisdom, and virtue, which is a, a, a trinity, and you got at, you look at God, nature, and providence also as a trinity, and you were to create a pyramid with, with each, you would see that God is at the top, then is nature, and then providence. Here, in this case, virtue is at the top, then wisdom, then uh, uh, philosophy. So to access virtue, you have to start with philosophy, then wisdom, then virtue. But in this case, what creates providence is God, and what created nature is also God. 
I personally like God in nature because I want to make sure that I don't sound too theist when I give those lectures because I don't want you guys to think that you need to believe in God to understand Stoicism, which is not true. So the two are connected. But from this point of view here, they're not. One is masculine, one is feminine. But at the end of the day, they're still connected because the, 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 the union of the masculine and the feminine gives the, the whole. It's what is making that entity complete. Because without nature, God wouldn't exist. Because we know of the existence of God because he created nature. And he created nature, of course, or vice versa. All right. It's very important to say, I didn't want to confuse you also, it's something, it's something that came to my mind. See, these texts are very important. So I, I hope you really read them. I hope you revisit them a lot. But to go back to that, that love that we get is masculine because it's order. Order is masculine. God created nature, but he created something via order that is essentially chaos, which then brings forth order by challenging us. So God gets what he wants. He loves us with that orderly love, tests us with that chaotic energy because he knows it will bring order to our lives. This is how it functions because now we are, at, we are after his image. Those that only remain in chaos and never seek to organize it are in a sense going against God. And it's the reason why also all of the anti-Christian, anti-Islam, anti-religion movements are pure expressions of chaos. If you look within, you will find that they have no core value because they cannot have any core value because it would mean to be orderly and they are incapable of that. And in comparison, he says also Seneca, and I need to find it. No, 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 no. I know that there was one that was very important. Yes. So he tells us that God loves us with a masculine love and follows by saying, whereas the indulgence of a fond mother makes us weak and spiritless. And I've already explained why. If, if the mother, the feminine energy is nature that creates providence, if you were just given no challenges, then you would be weak and unprepared. But thankfully, since God created providence, this in a sense, will never happen. It cannot happen. And if you, again, compare that and we go back to a more, to a more deeply rooted realistic view and reading of the text, a kid that is just being raised by a very fond and accepting mother that never challenges the kid will grow up to be detestable and miserable. It, he needs to be challenged. But, and that's the important part, there needs to be a balance. Just like nature doesn't bombard you with non-stop challenges and hurt, you also as a kid needed that balance of love and challenge, of nurture and action, constantly, constantly. And in this case here, the indulgence was created by the shield, meaning that we have, we have fabricated that indulgence. It's not really there, it's factitious. And it's so factitious that once you go back to the real world, where well, nature applies, it shows your weaknesses, that you're not prepared for that wood. So in a sense, just to also continue with this, the idea that providence would be feminine is linked with chaos and not the nature of it so that the indulgence of that very feminine energy that is being described here is in reality the antithesis to what is described as the masculine love of God. I hope that's clear. I know that in my head it is. I don't know if it is for you. But if you have questions, let me know. I can go back on that topic next time. So to follow up, are we not ourselves delighted to see a bold fellow press with his lens upon a line. And that corroborates the idea that that masculine love is what we like. Humans love challenges. When you, when you watch someone like a hero, he is not just sitting there drinking tea. He's fighting a lion because he's fighting chaos. He's, he's fighting to bring order. That is what we love. We strive for that. And so that is also the perfect contradiction to people who say, that seeking virtue through hardship is stupid. No, it's not. It's what we're born to do. 
the more we struggle with our necessities, we draw the knot the harder, and the worse it is with us, and the more of a, and the more a bird flaps and flutters in the snare, the surer she is caught. Wild assumption, the fact that the bird is being gendered here, in my opinion, is also a sign. It is a sign that, in a sense, refusing to face the chaos is seen as feminine, not in the sense that women are weak, but in the sense that the balance of feminine and masculine power in the world, when it comes to dealing with difficulties, goes towards the masculine, and that a surplus of feminine energy in this case can lead to ruin, and I think that we are seeing that nowadays in our world. We are way too feminine, we are feminized in many aspects, and this leads to inaction, or the type of action that does absolutely nothing, or we just move around and the snare becomes tighter and tighter. And that explains, by the way, the situation in most Western countries, where there are multiple issues going on, but no one wants to fix them because that would require masculine energy, and instead it's all a flapping around that is just making the issue tougher to deal with. And I'm going to leave you with that, that's a lot of things to digest at once, but I hope that you enjoyed this episode. And next time, next week actually, we're going to start with chapter 9. Thank you for watching, have a good day.